say. All right. There has probably been no job in the technology industry that has profoundly changed more in the last 10 years than that of the CIO. No longer is the CIO just in charge of delivering IT services. The CIO has become a very strategic part of their company's executive leadership team, aligning IT with the business strategy, providing guidance on digital strategy, and fostering real change in the, in the delivery of sorry, IT services that result in business growth. And of course, COVID-19 came along and slapped this right in its face. Uh, really changed things up. For the past 20 months, CIOs and IT executives have been in the eye of the storm. They're having to drive and navigate an incredible amount of change, respond to the rapid transformation of businesses, an uptick in global security threats, and the ever-increasing demand for my workforce that is now working remotely. The pace often seems frighteningly unsustainable. The successful CIOs of the future will need to rise to these increasing challenges. The best of them will demonstrate tremendous leadership, courage, stamina, expert partnership, and collaboration skills. Coupled with the ability to inspire incredible talent and foster a culture of innovation, commitment, and dedication. Now, we are privileged today to have one of the top CIOs in North Texas with us to talk about the changes she has seen in her company and also talk about the role of the CIO in the tech industry. Gertrude Van Horn, who most of us know as Trudy, uh, has been the CIO for NCH Corporation for 10 years. NCH is a $1 billion privately held manufacturing corporation headquartered here in North Texas with global operations in more than 58 countries. NCH provides industry leading products in water treatment, industrial maintenance, and lubrication. Trudy has spent her career providing business transformation from automating journal entry processes and claims processing systems. Everybody remember doing stuff like that? Yeah. At Aon to relocating money transfer operations from Wall Street to a secure data center in Delaware for JP Morgan and being responsible for the first corporate card data warehouse at Amex in Arizona. Here in Texas, Trudy came to deploy uh, apparel specific planning and manufacturing software for Haggard Clothing, who incidentally are the makers of the NFL Hall of Fame gold jackets. Now at NCA, she has invested more than 10 years to drive the strategy to modernize critical systems across 40 countries, to digitize and streamline sales and marketing tools for a global 4,000 person sales force, and to dramatically improve NCH's backbone, including significant improvements in network and security. And that's not all. Trudy is a 2020 winner of the DFW IT Luminary Award. The 2021 winner of the Dallas Corby CIO of the Year Award. And drum roll, she's a finalist for the 2021 Tech Titans Awards CIO. Kayla is on January 19th, and I hope you can join us. Like her counterparts at other corporations, Trudy has responded to COVID equipped a remote workforce in a matter of weeks, turned on a dime to support collaboration, driven changes to support a new sales dynamic, and transport processes and opportunities. And what have you done for me lately? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Okay. All right, no feedback, so that's good. So um, it has been a really tough 20 months and I don't have to tell that to this group. You guys know what we've all been through, trying to keep up with the demands of our internal business partners, keeping up with the demands of our external staff and, and their needs while they're working remotely and also accelerating all of the technology plans that we had on the plate. But it still feels like, what have you done for me lately? So the pan, oops. 
the pandemic um, has brought us really fast digital transformation. So for my team, for instance, we had teams, we had 50 licenses of teams that were being used in IT, couldn't get anybody else to use them. Within three weeks of going from home, we had 5,000 users on Teams. Um, we had a, a 32 year old Rome phone system. So if you cut, picture that back wall covered with patch panels, that was our phone system. And we had been trying to end of life that in favor of something else. Within five weeks of going home, that was all turned down as well. Um, and what we replaced it with is a phone system that could fit in a pizza box, right? <laughs> Go from all of that wall to the pizza box. So it has accelerated a lot of things for us. The technology is moving really, really fast. And the agenda that we already had didn't change. But what we find with this is, is not only was it technology acceleration, but it changed the culture of our businesses. The culture of the business became much more open to innovation, much more open to efficiencies, looking at continuous improvement and innovation. And as we can see in this um, article from Berkeley, you know, they, they are seeing it, flexibility, transparency, supportiveness. People are adopting things much, much faster than we've ever seen before. And it's called change agility. I love that phrase, change agility. The willingness of our business partners to go faster, take a little bit more risk, think differently about their business and all of this at a really fast pace of change. Even for small businesses, and I know a lot of the people in this room and online are part of small business and medium businesses, even the small and medium businesses had to rethink the way they do business. Think about the way they were going to deliver their products and their services and talk to their staff about adapting to these new business changes. So even though we've all been moving and changing it's still a bit of who moved my cheese, right? We still suffer the loss when we have a lot of change, um, but, but companies are helping their staffs walk through that. And the acceleration, you know, I was talking to Bill in the back, Bill said, you know, he thinks he, that the acceleration is 10 years. I thought it was two to three years. McKinsey thinks it's three to four years, but we're seeing it everywhere and it has not stopped. It's getting faster. And again, what have you done for me lately? All of that stuff you imp implemented yesterday doesn't matter anymore. What have you done for me lately? So how can we keep up the speed of innovation? What can we do to sustain? So this is my last trip to Manhattan. We strung a rope between two business buildings down Wall Street. I was wearing my white heels that day, not these gray ones. And um, that's me walking across the tightrope. CIOs do today have a really delicate balance. Um, we have a lot of great things that are happening in, in the industry. The business and IT collaboration is better than it has ever been. We're able to leverage this new interest by the business in innovation and the demand and the expectations continue to accelerate. It's been amazing to see all these great ideas. And there's willingness in the business to absorb the change. All of you know, if you deliver a product for your businesses, somebody has to train and try and test. And, and now the business is willing to take that risk. It doesn't have to be tied up with a bow and take nine months to get installed. And the investment appetite is there as well. People are willing to invest more in their businesses as long as they can see some contribution to the bottom line. But there's a lot of barriers. And I think all of you see this as well. You know, for our business partners, they don't think about the old stuff. NCH is 100 years old. I don't think we've ever thrown away a piece of paper. I don't think we've ever turned off a system, a server. We still got XP. We got 2003. They're still kicking around. Um, all of that stuff is there. You know, we call that technical debt. But however you slice it, it's a barrier. It's an obstacle. It's a speed bump. How do you deal with that stuff? How do you manage it and maintain it? Of course, we have increasing costs and complexity around security and compliance. Talent, the talent war is amazing. And, and for our team, we're dealing with Europe in the morning, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and we're dealing with Asia at night, 6 p.m., 7 p.m. My team is working at least 12 hour days, if not longer. And that burnout is palpable. We can feel it. Tempers are short. People are doing great work, but they're tired. Um, for me personally, while there is this interest in investment, 
I'm very cautious about that. Anytime I lose somebody during this talent war, it takes months to get them and it costs me more. We have inflation. Everything we're doing is costing more. Cloud hosting sounds cheap and easy. It ain't. It's, those costs are increasing, right? We know we are all collecting gobs of data. Those gobs of data cost something when they're in a cloud hosting environment. So one of the other fun things that IT gets to do is all the high-risk projects come to us because we got people trained in managing high-risk projects. All the crazy things failures also come to us as well, right? If the internet is down, if something is working too slowly, if I can't figure out how to use the password reset button, please call us. But this McKinsey study is really interesting. 17% of the IT projects are so disastrous, they threaten the existence of the company. So those are the kinds of things we're dealing with, right? And I know in my team, we've got projects like that. So. My team feels like we've got a lot of backlog. We have all of this demand that we've, we've got and we have had, and I've always had more demand than budget, always more demand than staff. But now it's even more because all of the business partners are thinking about innovation, thinking about efficiencies. How can they do things differently? I thought the backlog was just mine, but according to the economists, this is a worldwide thing. Everybody can't keep up. It's not just us. And no matter how fast we run, we can't keep up. And the business is frustrated by that. They want to go faster. Again, we're a hundred year old company. We have always been very measured in our investments, very analytical. We've taken our time. Now everybody wants to go, go fast. We'll take a little bit of risk, but we don't have that same um, groundswell of the talent. We, we are all facing this talent shortage and talent war. Um, and it's just hard to keep up with the escalating demand. The other thing that's happening, and I'm sure all of you see this if you're in um, larger companies, is the, um, we call it shadow IT, a lot of other people call it business IT, but the vendors don't call on me anymore, they go straight to the business. And, and the business is buying everything, right? They want to be able to do this themselves. And, and great, we want to enable everyone to be productive, but right about the time that they're ready to put that thing in production that they didn't need any IT help with, they realize it needs to be integrated with Oracle and it needs to have a little resiliency, maybe a server or two, a database backup, and then they come to us. So with this massively busy agenda, we also have this special credit items that we're having to do. What this is causing for us also is because the business is feeling good about driving their own technology changes, they think they should get a piece of that IT budget too. So not only is our budget shrinking from investment and inflation, our budget is shrinking because the business wants part of it as well. All fun stuff, part of that tightrope. Um, the other thing that the pandemic has done is it has exposed that soft underbelly of IT, right? All of the vulnerabilities that were not so prevalent when we were all in the office together, everybody was on an absolutely secure connection. We knew what people were doing and when they were doing it. Now we've got old technology, we've got vulnerabilities, things are not scaling around the world, we've got security threats. All of that is showing us that you know, there's a lot of care and feeding we need in that, in that underpinning. And again, our business partners don't see that, right? Nearly 80% of my budget is around support. Um, they don't see that. They see the sizzle. I got to deal with the steak, actually the cow and the butcher um, and the talent shortage. I don't know if you've read the statistics on this. This is amazing. 18 million people resigned between January and April. And then... Um, 3% of the workforce, the whole workforce resigned in August. And now we've just had 4 million people resign in September. And these people don't have other jobs. You know, Amazon is saying, oh, it's just the great reshuffle. Well, maybe for them it is, but it's not for us. There's a lot of people that have just had it up to here with the pace, the time, the demands, and the rethinking what is a priority in life. Um, but this is all on top of the talent wars that we've been facing for years. 
I love this article by Lisa Jasper. She's at Thought Ensemble in Denver. And she thinks the CIO's job is the hardest in the C-suite. And I think it is. it does have a variety of pressures. There's a lot of things we need to do. Take care of business partners and security threats and those great big old projects. The technical debt, the um, ability to continue to recruit, retain, uh, attract our talent. That's something that all of us need to be working harder on, getting our arms around the people that work for us. So still, can we keep up this pace? We've been doing it for 20 months now. How much more of it can we do? The good news is CIO relationships are better than they've ever been with business partners. It's amazing. Um, but we also have a larger challenge that we need to not only partner, we need to educate. All of the emerging tech coming in, you know, technology is a lot more technical today than it was three years ago. It's harder and explaining it is harder too. And that's our job as well. Not just getting the projects done, doing the um, portfolio reviews with them, talking to everybody about what we're doing, but also explaining to them and prioritizing with them what comes next. And it isn't a part-time job. So at NCH, we are on six continents. We've got hundreds of offices. I've got 15 to 17 CEOs, presidents, and executive vice presidents to deal with. They all have some degree of autonomy. It is hard to keep up those relationships. It has to be intentional. It has to be uh, in constant engagement to understand their issues and problems, to be able to factor those into the strategy for the future. And luckily, it's not just me, my team, understands this within within their core i'm going to do the rest with sign language now okay so um my team understands this too i have people who work for me for a, a long number of years and they have been uh working on on uh christy bonner's been working on sales and marketing for generations of projects across the world knows everybody continues to work with them on strategy. Joe Leonard has done supply chain projects all over the world, China, Czech Republic, Chile, Canada, all across the United States. So I have people on my team who have these really deep relationships and that gives us a seat at the table also for planning and prioritization and deep understanding of the business. This next section I wanna talk about is about investment decisioning um, and storytelling, interestingly enough. you know. Um, uh, investment discussions, they can't be the one-offs. We need to bake them into what we do every day, every quarter, every month, where we're talking about performance and accomplishments and relationships. And also investment is part of that discussion as well. Things are changing so fast. The funding that we planned a year ago is not necessarily going to cover what we need to do now. You know, we need to be talking with them about uh, new projects and initiatives, but we also need to be garnering business support. If we have one business executive that is standing shoulder to shoulder with us on an investment initiative, it's much more likely to go through. The other notion, um, I love this fourth bullet here. You really do need a different strategy when you talk funding with different people. It's not the one size fits all funding discussion. It's different materials. It's different ways. Some are face to face. Some you can do on the phone. Some you can do on a Teams meeting. Some need a PowerPoint. Others need a whiteboard. You need to know what that strategy is that's going to get that executive to number one, understand and number two, buy in. Um, but the art of storytelling, I know my peer CIOs and I talk about this all the time. I didn't get the funding. I'm not telling the right story. I need to figure out what story to tell. Well, storytelling is a real thing. Our brains work differently. If we hear a good story, we want to support the storyteller. It's the way we're made up. And there is science behind this because our brains produce oxytocin, which makes us have a feeling of well-being and empathy and social support. And all of that means they're going to be much more likely to understand and support your request. So storytelling is really a thing. It's not just a tactic. It's a real thing. It's a brain thing. And uh, the guy who did this, um, the guy who did this study on the last slide, he said he tells every business person he meets, start every 
discussion you have with someone with a story. That's the way you will get them to align with you. So um, this is me with all my rocks lined up, all the big ones on the bottom, the little ones on the top. You know, you have to get all your rocks in order, prioritize all your rocks, carry them around, don't, don't drop any. Um, it is a difficult challenge and we have to continue to get creative because the money is shrinking in a lot of ways. IT costs are escalating. So the, money, the million dollars doesn't go as far today as it went before. Cloud hosting million dollars doesn't go as far today as it went before. This, the security and compliance million dollars doesn't go as far as it did before because of all of the things that are adding to IT costs. It's the talent, it's the cloud hosting fees, it's the managed service providers. It's just the demand and complexity that we're building in our environments. The good news is, is we can get positioned for success. Cybersecurity and data protection continue to be really important. Um, moving to a digital native platform, I, I know most of you understand this, but I think it's worth talking about. My business partners think that I can gather up all that crap that's in the data center and plunk it down into the cloud hosting provider, and it's going to work beautifully. It's going to be flawless, no security problems. Yeah, that ain't happening. Um, those digital native platforms, you need to architect for them. And also those gobs of data you've been saving for a gazillion years, those are not free when they move to the cloud hosting provider. There's a lot of things we need to, to be looking after, um, but we can position ourselves for success. And finally, being frictionless, frictionless customer interaction. And that needs to be all of us with everybody. IT is hard to work with. We got priorities and funding and requirements gathering and project management people, right? We need to be easier to work with. And that is internally, that's externally with our vendors. It's with our business partners. We have to be easier to work with. So eliminating the barriers, you know, solve for the things that are really impeding pro progress. Talent is clearly the number one issue, and it's going to get worse. I had lunch with a guy from Gartner last week, and he said they are predicting 30% turnover within the next year. And he already has one client that's beyond 30% turnover. Um, business relationships, that technical understanding of the business, as well as the business revenue and, and customer perspective understanding, we need to have that in IT. And we need to keep that fresh because they are moving fast and we need to be moving fast with them. Um, data quality, one of the greatest opportunities we have is for data to help us make better decisions, make that data high quality, make it available to everyone, harness that data. And then finally, all of that old stuff that we've been saving for a hearted years, we got to figure out how to get rid of that. Re-architect it, turn it off, maybe don't tell anybody. <laughs> so this is this is the key um, for me and and this is very difficult focus on a few small carefully curated impactful initiatives and never lose focus on them right some of you know the notion of the critical few you might have read the book the critical few it's about knowing what those high value targets are and the ones you picked six months ago might not be the same ones today, but that focusing on that critical mass of projects, that's what's really important. And it takes a lot of prioritization and you have to get, get really friendly with that word no, that none of us like, no. It's really bad when you have to say no to the board, no to the CFO, no to the head of the business. So this is my public service announcement. I think some of the people that we have in the room and some of the people that we have online are maybe small and medium businesses. And I would be remiss if we didn't talk about cybersecurity and ransomware. So small businesses think they're immune from this. Oh, nobody's gonna come after me. I don't have anything anybody wants to steal. Well, these are the stats. 61% had an attack in the last year. 43% of small businesses don't even have a plan. 83% can't recover from a, a cyber attack. They don't have the finances. 60% of small businesses will close their doors within six months of having a cyber attack. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the managed service providers, those guys you go to to do your IT work or your cloud hosting or your offshore support, 
they are worried on behalf of their small business clients because they see it as the number one issue. But if you ask the small business clients, they still say, oh, no, not us. Nobody wants to come after us. So again, public service announcement. These are the things that you can tackle if you're a small business. Um, and these are the same kinds of things we tackle with the big business as well, right? Educate people. They need to know about malware and viruses and social engineering. If you've got multi-factor authentication and somebody convinces you, oh, I'm the bank and I'm testing that. Can you just tell me what code you got that I just sent? Yeah, that's social engineering. And there goes all of your retirement funding. Um, you need to keep all of your devices updated, right? Um, having virus protection is really important. Keep that updated. And those operating systems need to be updated. If they're too old, no security threats are getting added. And you need to be, be worried about that. Um, endpoint protection. This is like the virus protection on steroids. Um, everything should be detecting whether or not you've got bad stuff happening in your devices and be able to alert and get rid of it. Password best practices. We still find people that are sharing credentials and still have the password taped to their PC. That's got to stop. That's got to stop. And the number one password is still password. Password. And now it's like with an exclamation point because you need to have a special character, right? Either put it in the beginning or put it in the end or turn the O into a zero, right? It's still password. Yeah, stop that. Um, Multi-factor authentication, I talked about that. Um, it, it's easier to do than it's ever been. Network, virtual private network. Things will be more secure if you've got a virtual private network. Talk to your ISP provider about this. Leverage the free stuff. For small businesses, Department of Homeland Security has free stuff for small businesses. And I have the, it's sba.gov and look for scans and assessments. They will help you out and help you be more protected. Back up your data, and I'll talk about this in a minute. And then finally, the last one, not, it's not for everybody, the cyber insurance. It is getting more and more expensive every year. But if, if your business is a critical business, mission critical business, you ought to be thinking about it and talking to your broker about it. So backups. So think ransomware. Yay! You got a server. All your data, your application, your customers, it is encrypted. They want $100,000 within the next four days. If you've got a spare server with the application and all of the customers on it in somebody else's house plugged in, you can just unplug that brick ransomware and come up with your new copy from your friend's basement right? Think about this. I encourage all of you, particularly small business owners, sit with the people who have the data, access to credit card numbers, who have your customer list, and say to them, what happens if we lost the system? What would you do? And that becomes the beginning of your incident response plan. This is really important. Um, it's happening to more and more people all the time. Okay, and this is me with my crystal ball. I wanted to share all of my crystal ball things with you. Um, from Gartner, the top three investments for 2022 are the same as they were for 2021. It's all about cybersecurity, and then it's all about data and data analytics, and then it's all about the cloud. So those have not changed from 2021 to 2022. This chart, I don't mean it to be an eye chart, but you know, we, we look at a lot of things that talk about technology trends and they're about go buy this tech and install it and off you go, life is beautiful. This is how to leverage all of the goodness that you've learned in technology leadership and partnering with your business to make a difference, changing business models, changing your service delivery model. These are great things. Um, number four, reimagine user support for a hybrid and smart workplace. Well, when we all went home, we just all dealt with it, right? We figured it out, we dealt with it, but we did not architect for it. It is not the best it could be. It could be far better. You know, that's something that, that um, you know, until I read that, I thought, yeah, if we had five minutes to stop and think about it, we probably wouldn't have done it this way. There's modern digital infrastructures, architecting for the cloud so that you can take advantage of the cloud. Um, number nine, I love. Number nine, um, I, I envision that as a consortium 
of my technology leader buddies and industry leaders that we work with. And coming together in a consortium to solve problems that we're all solving independently. We're all thinking about the same stuff. We're solving these independently, maybe with different tech. What if we were doing this in, in a consortium-based way? A much better outcome, a collaborative outcome that gives us something much better that five of us might be able to craft better than just one of us sitting at home with our uh, plastic whiteboard. Um, and then the, the number 10 item, I didn't even think about that. That was surprising to me. Sustainable IT makes sense, but didn't really think about that. So I'm going to give that one a think. These are the small business trends. I include these because, again, I think that we have small business owners here in the room. You'll see a lot of this stuff is tech as well. E-commerce, remote work, communication applications like Teams or Zoom or um, any of those, cashless payments we know, virtual events. So um, we've got our new luminary in the room, Shanti. Would you stand up, Shanti? Yay, Shanti. Shanti ran um, a virtual uh, platform for uh, the Executive Leadership Forum for DFW ATW. There were hundreds of people from all over the country attending. And we sat at virtual 10 tops of people where we could have a private conversation. And then we left the 10 top and went to a different 10 top and had a conversation with the people there. And then we were all called to order to listen to the keynote speaker. That is a rocking kick ass virtual platform for an event, right? You don't have to talk to 3,000 people. You can pick the table that you want to move around to. Virtual events are here to stay. Personalized artificial intelligence sounds like way out there, right? But until you look at the, the examples, chatbots on websites, Siri, smart assistants, um, personalized recommendations, which we get all the time when we're on Facebook or we're on Amazon. Um, so this stuff is going to happen more and more, and your businesses are going to need it more and more. Video marketing, we're tired of looking up for sure where we want to watch people doing things and saying things and demonstrating things. And then finally, gig workers, how can you leverage them? You know, one of the gals I know, she's doing marketing stuff with a gig worker. He actually skis in Switzerland all day, and then he works on her marketing stuff at night. And she gets a great price for it and uh, no overhead, basically uh, one man van and the ski slopes. Okay. So I don't know if you're feeling overwhelmed. I'm certainly feeling overwhelmed. Um, and they're still wanting to know why I'm not getting all that other stuff done so fast. So, and they'll never get it. But for you, relax, refresh, recharge. It has been a hell of a 20 months. Figure out how to step back from that and take a breath. You know, think hard about what you're doing and why you're doing it and reconsider your priorities. Technology is everywhere. I don't know if you remember Jean-Luc Jean Picard, but resistance is futile. <laughs> so um, if you're not a tech person in your business, get a tech person in your business because it's coming and you're either going to be ahead of that curve or you're going to be run over by it, one or the other. McKinsey put together a list of five or six things about what executives should be thinking about. And I love this, become the fastest learner. If you look at the list of Gartner Trends for 2022, they make your eyes roll back in their head. Data mesh, cybersecurity fabric. I, I may have gotten those backwards. What the hell is that? So become the fastest learner. Find 20 minutes every couple of days to go Google some of this stuff. Learn it, understand it. And lean on the network. Look at this room. There are people in this room that connect, can connect you to someone who can help you with just about any problem you have. And that is true of all of the tech forums we have across North Texas. We are so blessed. I've worked all over the country. There's nothing like this community, welcoming, collaborative, communicative. And don't just lean on them professionally, lean on them personally, because we're all going through this crap together. And it's great to just complain to somebody and they go, yeah, I hate that too. <laughs> so we because we are, are all moving so fast we don't have enough time to finish everything with a bow and beautiful documentation those days are gone and you just have to you just have to deal with it those days are gone so excellence does not require perfection it doesn't and don't require it of your staff either because they 
are just as exhausted as you are. Call things done and move on. And there you go. If they're not done, somebody else is going to come and they're going to say, hey, you didn't finish that. Get, get, get back to work. Um, but for now, you have to figure out what your definition of excellence is and move on. Celebrate the superhero within you. When I look in the mirror, sometimes I can see my cape. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I can see it. But we've got superheroes on our teams as well. And we need to get our arms around them and appreciate them. That's the only thing that's going to keep them because eventually Amazon's going to walk in and give them $25,000 more than you can give them. So find another way to celebrate your heroes. And for all of us, business people and technology people, we need to inspire and motivate and have people who want to work with us, who long to work with us, who love the culture that we've developed. Get your arms around your people, inspire, motivate, and drive innovation. It is the coolest time. There are low code and no code solutions out there. We can have citizen developers helping us solve these problems. It's up to us to make sure we are driving that continuous innovation, continuous improvement mindset. Find a way, even if it's through a, a forum that you get together every couple of weeks and you just talk about the things, it's going to spark a fire for somebody and lift others up. Um, I, this is probably the most important slide of all the slides. So uh, when I talk to CIOs about this, Across the country, there are fewer than 20% female CIOs. We're 50-50 in the workforce, fewer than 20% female CIOs. And across the country, there are fewer than 3% black executives. And you know what? We need to change that. If you're a hiring manager for anything, you need to think about that. You need to identify top talent, grab them by the hand, connect them, partner with them, mentor them, advocate for them, Set them up with your network, but we all need to lift up others. We don't have enough people in technology now. And as the technology accelerates, it's just going to get worse. So lift up others. So you didn't come this far just to come this far. There's so much more and it's coming at us so, so, so fast. And it's not just about the tech guys. It's about everybody. You know, I love this from Barry Ross. It's not up to one guy to do digital transformation. It's up to everybody. It needs to be a culture, a mind shift. It needs to be the way we think about our businesses, about innovation and continuous improvement. And it's going to take all of us to figure out these new business models that are winning business models. And then finally, all of us, CIOs, all of us. I love what Beso said, what's dangerous is not to evolve. So this is an evolutionary pro process. We are all just getting started. And I'm going to come back three years and still say we're all just getting started because it's changing so fast. So stand with me and evolve. Thanks. Am I supposed to take questions? I don't know if I'm supposed to take questions. I'm no, going to stand here. So I'd just like to say on behalf of Tech Titans, let's all get together and give Trudy a big round of applause. When you go back to your offices this afternoon, make sure you hug your CIO. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to open up for Q&A now. Paul, who's monitoring it online? I don't have anything online. Yay, nothing came in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who has a question? Come on. The question is, is are we uh, able to get a copy of the presentation? The yeah, I think, I think you guys do that, right? Yeah. Yes. Sure. yes. Okay. If I have anything further. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Trudy, I noticed on your slide about kind of uh, the CIO role. One of the things I didn't see on there, which was around change management, um, how uh, technology and CIO is part of that. Can you go to explain just how important change management is part of IT? Yeah, I deleted one of the slides. It said, um, relax, it's just chaos. <laughs> so, yeah, change, change management is a constant for us, right? It is all about understanding where, where the not only where the changes are that we are making, all the changes are that the industry is making and how to, how to introduce those in the right way. It is not for the 
excuse me, it's not for the faint of heart. There are so many of us um, working in the environment at the same point, high collaboration, high communication, um, but yeah, change management is key to everything we do. And that's when I think back on that slide that says, um, you know, uh, about excellence and perfection, right? Um, change management, you could spend your whole life doing change management, not really get the stuff done. So it is a, it is a fine balance that we, we walk. Is that okay, JT? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, Chris, <laughs> just a quick question. Can y'all hear us without the microphone? Do we need the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Go ahead. Chris. If you were advising people who are going through college, et cetera, who are looking and saying, gee, I'd like to be this seed something of technology, what two or three skills would you advise them to focus on um, for that path to greatness? Choosing good wine. <laughs> 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 um, it, so the CIO job, that Lisa Jasper slide I love, it really is all of those things. You need to be really good at project management, obstacle and issue identification and resolution. Um, uh, you can't be a CIO if you've got a thin skin or you need to be loved. It just ain't for you, right? <laughs> no is kind of one of my favorite words, sadly, we say it a lot, there just isn't enough money to do everything. So I would ask them about that. I have people on my staff who need to be loved and those really tough conversations are just not their cup of tea. Um, I, I think a natural curiosity, really a driving curiosity because that be the fastest learner really is about that. You know, we are lucky all of the vendors around us will come and teach us stuff, right? They'll come and teach just will come and show us you don't necessarily have to buy they're happy to go out and, go out and test the pitch with you um, but that understanding where the new technology is coming from and then deep 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 knowledge at every level you have to understand where the business gets its money where all of its costs are who are the drivers and who are the coattail hangers you know, who are the people that are in the strategy meetings and how do you get in those meetings with them? So it's, it's technology, it's toughness. It is the ability to tightrope walk in high heels. It is um, that whole notion about, about um, the, the deep relationships that allow you to influence strategy, priorities, make good decisions. And then you have to be, um, you have to, be some kind of a guiding light for your staff, right? You need to understand when they are exhausted and how to lift them up. And you need to understand who needs some kudos and who needs a mentoring session and who you just need to go and take out to lunch and, and be appreciative of. So it's a lot of things, but that Lisa Jasper slide is probably my favorite for, for where the challenges are. Did I answer your question? Solomon. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's on the edge. Yeah. yeah, so let me ask you a question. As technology becomes more pervasive and embedded in the business, do you see the role of the CIO actually becoming distributed into the business line? Much of the same way, if I look back to the start of the Industrial Revolution, we kind of are in the information revolution. Yeah. There was a CEO who was a chief electrical officer that was responsible for providing, ensuring that there was power yeah. for a factory and a facility. Yeah. I'm just curious, as, as you point all this stuff out and you talk about deep understanding of the business all the way through, you know, all of those things here start to, I ask the question, does the role change fundamentally that it actually doesn't exist, it actually becomes distributed into the organization? So for those of us who work in larger companies, there's that CIO role in the business. There are people that we go to. We know there are people within that business that are really good at tech and really tech advocates. Um, I do think there needs to be some form of a central clearinghouse because, you know, when anytime we go and look for a couple strategic technologies at NCH Corporation, we've probably got five of them deployed across the world. That's just that's a money waster, right? So there needs to be some kind of a centralized clearinghouse. It doesn't need to be the one um, uh, prescribing the technology, but there needs to be a high level coordination. You know, the shadow IT, my team, they um, are challenged by shadow IT. For me personally, I think it's a great way for them to get R&D out of their system, right? 
Oh, we're going to do this. It's so easy. Six weeks later. Yeah, this is so hard. Um, okay, so I didn't have to waste anybody's time on that. If it's a breakthrough technology, great. We got a skunk work so we can help them get into the production. So I think there are people like that and they know who they are and smart CIOs have to partner with those people, like it or not. How concerned should we be about the impact of technology on personal privacy? Here's an example. So last week, I used the Waze app to find my way around from time to time. And this was an address that I had never put in before. I put in 5109, the street number, and it knew what street I wanted. And I had no idea how it knew, but I thought that was a little scary. Yeah, so I personally am very concerned about personal privacy, but anybody that's between 12 and 22 will tell you everything, where they ate, what they ate, where, everything. So it, for people our age, it's different than for really young people. But yeah, I, I do worry about that. I don't, I don't have Facebook. I don't do Twitter. I don't do LinkedIn, except except Peter Vogel keeps wanting me to change my LinkedIn profile and make it better. <laughs> but other than that, um, yeah, I, I don't want people to know all that. I think the data privacy laws are um, um, need to be a lot more common. You know, the one in California is so different than the one in New York. And, um, you know, the ones in Colombia are different than the ones in China. So, yeah, I think we should all be concerned about privacy, but you know what? We're not. We turn on the, you can track me. We turn on the, you can track my phone. Find my phone? Find my phone is the same as where the hell am I and where am I doing, right? So yeah, I think people give up way too much privacy and it's not until it's all given up do they know. I don't know if all of you know, the dark web, you know, we can see this much of the web. All of the rest of it is an iceberg under the water. The dark web, every one of your names are out there, guaranteed. Your credit card numbers are out there, your favorite passwords. If you have a favorite password, stop using it because it's already out there. They'll take your new credentials and your favorite password and they'll try all of your bank accounts. Yeah, there's, there is no privacy anymore because in many ways we've given it up. Anytime you turn the cookies on, right? Yeah. Hey, Trudy, can I go add something to that? Just for JT is my yeah. security guy. So. <laughs> yeah, just, just for, just for reference, I mean, whenever you're downloading a, a free app on your phone, there's a reason why it's free. Okay, you know they don't just do it just because they're um, you know just Filling wanting them to make everyone's lives easier. What you don't realize is in the agreement when you download that application that they have access potentially to your address book, to your photographs and whatnot. And you're agreeing to that wherever you download that app. So at times you will get some metadata that's being ingested into the application that goes through and is being sold to third parties. That's what you don't know about. So yeah. just be, be real careful about the applications you install because you're essentially agreeing to, you know, having access to probably sensitive information you probably would want to share. Down here. Do we, do we present Presentation today. Thank you. I like how you integrated humor, and I like all your quotes. Awesome. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. I heard you mention that it starts going to twelve hours or more of work. As much as we are passionate about doing stuff and it's how challenging we want to do it, do you have any ideas or strategies that you're able to share today? What you're doing? So, um, I I have a team that is. Truly, a bunch of overachievers, crazy overachievers. Um, Joe Leonard, who works for me, he said, "I don't work from home. I sleep at the office, and that's how he feels. You, know, for, you can't walk by the PC without checking it, right?" Um, I don't have a good strategy. I have. You know, I was asked in a panel a couple weeks ago. You know, tell us about a work-life balance. It's like that's a myth. That does not <laughs> exist. That is a fairy tale. That's like the prince coming in on the white horse. Ain't happening. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think people need to set boundaries and follow them. Um, you know, if you're going to say that I'm not going to check my phone during dinner and the boss calls and you answer the phone, you've just told everybody that you're you're fair game. Anytime, anywhere, you're fair, fair game. I I don't take my phone someplace. People are shocked by that. Um, but 
sometimes if you promise somebody you're going to do something with them, you kind of have to live up to that, right? There's there's a book I think it's called Pick Three Things. Mm -hmm. So there are are five like um, sleep and sleep is actually one of them. sleep, <laughs> family, friends, fitness, and work. And you can only have three every day. You can only have three. Pick three because you can't get all five done. Um, and and how do you have that quality time with children, particularly if you're not setting those boundaries? Because they're not going to be setting them. Sorry, not much of that. No, I also heard you say that saying no is your favorite word. I think that's another strategy at work to maybe they use gold because there are infinite things if you're up to it, right? Well, and and that um, slide about perfection and excellence. You know, you guys are in this room because you lead something or somebody or or have great aspirations. That that slide is for all of you, right? You know, we could take that one project that we worked on and we could polish it up for another three days. There's just not enough time. You have to figure out how, what is correct for you and just forgive yourself and move on. Um, but yeah, we need to be setting our own boundaries. I tell people block two hours on your calendar every day and don't give it up. That way you have at least time to think and write and scribble down some notes and get something to eat and maybe walk around the block for a minute but block some time yeah so there was a slide in your presentation about the amount of people that are leaving their jobs mm -hmm. and it's large do you know where they're <laughs> yeah going? it's are really large your competitor are they going to start their own small business because i think that a lot of people are trying that but the trend might be that they may come back because a lot of those small businesses may not work or are they just completely rewriting their life and just going in a completely new career do you know so so i don't know that they have enough data on this yet um, but i've read a lot of stuff um they feel like a full third of them have just unplugged right and they will come back to the workforce but they've unplugged they just had enough they put aside some money they're going to travel or lay on the beach or sit in the backyard or binge watch yellowstone <laughs> they're going to do something like that <laughs> Um, and then others, uh, I talked to the guy um, I had uh, lunch with a partner. He said, anyone who quits now and goes and looks for another job is almost guaranteed to get a 15% increase. Mm -hmm. And some are getting 30 to 40. So there are some people that are like that. Um, and, and others may be starting their own business, but if they think they were working hard before, <laughs> go ahead and start yeah. their own business. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah okay. Actually come back yeah. about a year. And then you go back to that fine good oh, lines yeah. slot. Yeah. So, Here's the back. Yes. Along those same lines, what are your thoughts about the new version of like a digital nomad? The, the kid that wants to kick back on the beach at the line and then and, and, uh, whatever, nine o'clock at night, he starts, let's say he works for a company in California. Yeah. And starts his day. Mm -hmm. So there's a guy I know, his name is South um, Sodtash. I don't know if you guys know him. His company is Crowdflat. And all he does is crowdsource projects. He guarantees that he will give you a project manager to manage it, but he crowdsourced from all over the world. Yeah, and those are absolutely digital nomads. They may take one or two gigs every six months, and that's about all. I told you about the gal who's using somebody that's a, uh, almost an expert skier in Switzerland. Same kind of thing. Uh, I think there's, we've proven you can do that, right? We've been remote for 20 months now in, in NCH Corporation. My team, not all the teams, my team. So we've proven you can be a digital nomad quite successfully. Yes. Yeah, I was curious about the room system when you went to the pizza. <laughs> I'm just we're, gonna ask we've asked the Smithsonian if they want it. <laughs> but you don't have to answer. I'm just curious, who did you go with? Because I'm familiar with the UCAS Cisco. providers. Cisco. We're a Cisco shop. So it all integrated. Oh, the ROM system? No, no, no it didn't integrate anything. Really but yeah, Cisco. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wires, let us know. We'll snip you <laughs> We got blue ones, pink ones, yellow ones. Right? We got time for one more question. He wants to stop Trudy. I'll say something. Uh, what about the you talked about the talent shortage? As uh, obviously being in the industry, I understand a little bit about that, but then also understanding you know how it's affected your company, and, and of course related to those numbers that you brought up as, as NCH surviving through this? Yeah, so um, for my team in particular, I have an amazing team. 
an amazing culture. My team loves working with my team. We collaborate. We have, um, you know, I'm, I'm high collaboration, high communication. I believe we are smarter together than I could ever possibly be. People like that. They like to feel empowered. I can't compete on price, right? Texas Instruments is down the street and Exxon Mobil and McKesson and Kimberly Clark. I can't compete on price. I can only compete on culture. That said, I have um, smaller amounts of turnover than a lot of companies do. However, I have people that are saying things like, I wasn't looking for a job, but they called me and they, they offered me $100,000 in stock options and a $60,000 signing bonus. It's like, have a good life. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing you can do, right? right. There's nothing you can do for that. Um, I always tell them the same thing. I hope you hate where you're going and you'll have the door open when you come back. And that does happen. It does happen when people come back. Yeah. Again, I want you to, uh, to join me and thank you, Trudy, uh, for spending time with us today. behalf of Tech Titans and the Tech Industry Lunch and our Programs Committee, thank you for spending the time. Oh, it was lovely. Yes. My honor. Thank you so much. And Love then, this organization. Don't forget to hug your CIO when you get back. Yeah. Now, if you'll bear with me for some supposedly brief closing announcements. All right. I briefly mentioned the Tech Titans Award Gala at the start of the show. It is January the 19th. It will be at, just up the street, the Eisman Center here in Richardson. Uh, we have 15 award uh, to give out that night, including the CIO award, which Trudy is one of four finalists for. So let's hopefully uh, applaud her own in. Uh, ticket VIP tickets will go on sale in December, and mezzanine tickets go on sale in January. You may buy the tickets online or through the ITN Center uh, box office. All the details will be on the techtitans.org slash awards page. The gala will feature two thought leaders sessions in the afternoon, in addition to the 15 awards that we will present. Uh, this luncheon does conclude our 2021 series. We return in 2022 after the gala on, write it down, it's not the third Friday. It's the fourth Friday of January, January the 28th. And once again, we're going to screw all your minds up. We are going to the Drury Hotel, which is up off 75 uh, in Richardson. We will have speaking Simon, Simon Severini. He is the director of quantum computing for AWS. He will be talking about 10 things to know about quantum computing. <laughs> There's only 10. Uh, set a high level view of quantum computing along with best use cases from the AWS Center for Quantum Computing at Caltech. It is a must attend event that will kick off our 2022 uh, season. So mark January 28th on your calendar. And again, you may find details for the gala, for the tech industry lunch, and all of our forums at techtitans.org. As we close out the year, we wish again to thank Dr. Rod Wetterstock, who is not with us today. Yeah. Cynthia Hen, oh, he is? Okay. Mm -hmm. Cynthia Hen and Don Prichel from UT Design for their sponsorship. Uh, today, we also had sponsors from uh, DFW AT, DFW ATW, is that right? Yes. And uh, McNeely Technology. So I'd like to give a shout out to Mary Elizabeth and to Shanti for uh, buying papers. And I'd also like, like to recognize in the room our, our mayor, Richard Paul Wilker. Thank you for being here. So, whether you attended virtually or here at this beautiful state of the art HEXA co working facility, I want to thank you for attending. Wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you get to take most of next week off. And at Trudy's point, leave that phone somewhere else on Thanksgiving Day, unless you're trying to watch the bus course. And then I'll let you have it. We are now adjourned. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to